name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I'm privileged to serve St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, St. Luke's Covington, and Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville. Thank you for the opportunity to spend this time with you in God's Word. Today we're going to continue in Luke chapter 20. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, have mercy on us that with you as our ruler and guide we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, it's Tuesday of Holy Week, the Great Week. Jesus is teaching in the temple. We've just heard the parable of the wicked tenants. It's about that landowner who plants a vineyard and at the suitable time sends representatives to get his share of the produce. But the tenants won't give him any fruit of the vineyard. Instead, they beat one representative, treat the second one shamefully, and wound the third and throw him out. But amazingly, the owner decides to send his own beloved son. The tenants throw him out of the vineyard and kill him. And what happens as a result, the owner will certainly come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to someone else. Well, of course, Jesus is that beloved son. The owner is the father. The wicked tenants are the religious leaders in Jerusalem. The very people listening in as Jesus tells this parable to the crowds. Jesus has described exactly in this parable what's going to happen to him later that week when he will be taken outside the city walls of Jerusalem and nailed to a cross. Well, let's continue now with chapter 20 of Luke, verses 19 and following. Note that right away we're told that these very enemies of Jesus are trying to get something on him so as to be able to bring charges against him before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. Luke 20, beginning at verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. Just who was Caesar? The word Caesar was actually the family name of a Roman ruler named Julius Caesar. When he was assassinated in 44 BC, his grand nephew Augustus took over and also took the name Caesar. That was the Caesar Augustus, you remember, who issued the decree for a census that sent Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Thereafter, the title Caesar was so closely associated with the Roman emperor that the rulers came to be called Caesar. In fact, the name comes down into the Russian language as Tsar and into the German as Kaiser. In the days when this conversation took place, Scripture tells us that it was Tiberius Caesar who was ruling over the empire, including Palestine, where Caesar ruled over the stubborn Jewish people through his appointed governor, Pontius Pilate. So when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, he's speaking about the government as distinguished from the kingdom of God. Caesar, for us, is the United States of America and all its agencies and offices from the Internal Revenue Service, responsible for collecting our taxes on a national level, 
also down through the state of Illinois, Washington County. It includes the courts at every level, the whole system of earthly government under which we live. Let's compare Caesar with God, the earthly authority with God's heavenly kingdom. First, some similarities. Both have been established by God. We are not to think that the church has been established by God while the state has been established by man. No, no. Regarding these earthly authorities, the Lord says to us, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's in Romans 13. In both cases, God rules. Both kingdoms belong to God since he has established them both. It's often been described as the kingdom of the left hand and the kingdom of the right hand, or even as God's twofold kingdom. Both have been established by God for the good of mankind. In the Catechism, we're reminded that good government is one important blessing out of the many that have to do with the support and needs of the body. Devout and faithful rulers in peace are also included in the daily bread that God gives us, even when we don't deserve it. Good government protects the innocent and punishes the guilty. Good government provides for the protection and defense of the nation and allows people to carry out their lives with dignity and security. God commands us to pray for both. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come. Here we're asking that God would continue to send his Holy Spirit so that we would believe his holy word and live lives according to it. But we're also taught to pray for our rulers. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2. In both kingdoms, God calls us to serve our neighbor. What a blessing when we have godly men and women serving in government, people who are really public servants and use their time in office not to line their own pockets, but to seek the common good. So also in the church, there are many opportunities to show love to our neighbor. Well, what about the differences? Well, the kingdom of the left shows us our sin. The kingdom of the right forgives our sin. Or to put it another way, Caesar exists and continues on the basis of the law, but God's kingdom stands on the gospel. The kingdom of the left has to do with you get what you deserve, you get what you earn. But on the right, it has to do with God's free gift and favor. Namely, I give you salvation in Jesus Christ, my son, simply out of great mercy. Caesar operates in the realm of works. God deals with us according to gifts. The central message of the kingdom of the right is that Christ Jesus, God's one and only Son, gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins when he was put to death on the cross. It shows us that Jesus, the world's only perfect citizen, covers over our sins with his perfect righteousness. It shows us the resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of the world. Also, Caesar cannot save you, but the kingdom of God can. You can be the best citizen on earth, but it will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. Faith in Jesus' death and resurrection for us is necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And that faith is precisely what God is giving in the means of grace, which are the marks of his kingdom. Caesar cannot solve everything. Christ can. Some people seem to have the idea that if only their candidate will get elected, everything will be perfect. Our nation will enter a new era of prosperity. Our status around the world will be lifted. The planet will be saved. Now, it is true that good government is a blessing from God for which to be thankful, but it can only do what God in his providence allows man to do. Caesar's kingdom is gathered by the word of men. God's kingdom is gathered by the word of God. Decrees and laws 
that are enforced make up the kingdom of the left hand, the church operates on God's decree as announced in his word that Christ has made satisfaction for all the sins of the world. We come under Caesar by means of our physical birth. We come under the kingdom of Christ by means of our rebirth in holy baptism. In the kingdom of the left, we must pay. In the kingdom of the right, God gives blessings. Whatever was required to save us, Jesus paid, paid it all. When the rules conflict, we follow God's rules instead of Caesar's. Recall the decree of the king of Egypt that all the boy babies were to be killed at birth. The two Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, deliberately disobeyed the king's command. Exodus 1. And God blessed them for it. Acts 5.29. We ought to obey God rather than man. We follow the rules of Caesar out of the fear of punishment. We follow the rules of God out of love. Good government gives outward peace that provides bodily comfort and protection. The kingdom of God provides peace with God and peace in the heart and soul. In the church, God gives peace which the world cannot give. Caesar is temporal. The kingdom of God is eternal. Every earthly kingdom will fail and fall, but the Christ will reign in the kingdom of our God forever and ever. Those who study world history can tell us that it is the story of one kingdom replacing another as king of the hill on the world scene every so often. If we think that the United States of America will last until the Lord Jesus returns, we have no guarantee of that. If we believe that the United States of America will remain as the most powerful nation on earth, we have no guarantee of that. God has never even mentioned our country in his word. Those who want to find modern nations and specific prophecies in scripture are sadly mistaken. However, in Christ, we are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Hebrews 12. The powers of Caesar are limited, but the power of God is unlimited. Yes, God rules over kings. Proverbs 21 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. In short, we may sum up the words of Jesus in the words of an ancient teacher of the church who said, Give the money unto Caesar, that is your taxes, give thyself to God. May God help us to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And let's pause and listen to the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, speaking about our whole self being consecrated, set apart for God. This is a recording of the hymn sung by the congregation at New Minden when we gathered for our confirmation reunion, July 30th, 2017.
let's continue now in Luke chapter 20 as another group tangles with Jesus, beginning at verse 27. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. And some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Among the powerful words that we often use but may not think about too often are the words of the creed when we say, I believe in the resurrection of the body and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. A resurrection, by definition, means that the very thing which lies down in death will get up again in life. Scripture teaches that all people will rise again on the last day, some to eternal life with God, some to eternal punishment away from God. For the believers in Christ, it means that we will receive this body again, but in a renewed state. Based on these words of Jesus and many others in Scripture, we confess the resurrection of the body. We confess the resurrection of the body to a world that doubts. The conversation begins with a question from the Sadducees, whom Luke tells us plainly that they deny that there is a resurrection. Oh, there are many today like the Sadducees. They want to say there's no such thing as a resurrection of the body. They're not going to rise again. They're not going to be held accountable. They're not going to stand before Jesus, the judge. Now, to be sure, this is a radical and amazing teaching. And doubts may enter into our minds at times. Stand at the mortal remains of an elderly person whose body simply wore out. Multiple systems fail and even the best medicine can't prolong the inevitable any longer. The years take their toll so that finally even the strongest people, those with the best genes and the healthiest of habits, they all succumb to death. Or stand before the closed casket of a young person killed in an accident. Go to the graveside of an infant who never thrived. Consider the young person cut down by some horrific cancer or a stray bullet. These wrecked and broken bodies become cold and lifeless and stiff and the forces of nature very quickly begin to have their way with them. Every fact of medicine and science tells us that there's no way that these bodies can live again. How can we believe, teach, and confess the resurrection of the body? And even if we believe it, why does it not have a greater effect on us? We confess the resurrection in the name of our resurrected Lord. There are so many other Old Testament passages that clearly confess the resurrection of the body. There's clear testimony in the Psalms and from Daniel and Job and the prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel. So why did Jesus choose this passage from Exodus? Well, remember that the Sadducees accepted only the five books of Moses as their Bible. One of the articles of their faith was that there is no such thing as a resurrection and there are no angels or spirits. That's from Acts 23. So Jesus uses Exodus chapter 3 to show that there is a resurrection of the body. That's when God called Moses from the burning bush. 
but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed, Jesus told these Sadducees. In the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, now he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. You see, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob died hundreds of years before Moses was even born, and yet God was still their God. God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. If you belong to him, you are alive and will always be alive. In Old Testament times, God demonstrated this by marvelous works of the prophets calling the dead back to life. And consider the ministry of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Consider how time and again he rolled back the forces of death, not only healing the sick, but raising the dead. Why, he wrecked every funeral he ever attended. There was the young man of Nain being carried out to the cemetery. There was the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, who lay cold and lifeless, Jesus took her by the hand and said, Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise. And she got up alive. And of course, there was his friend Lazarus, who had died and his mortal remains had already been in the tomb four days when Jesus got there. Yet Jesus called him out alive, Lazarus, come out. You get the picture. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. With a simple word from his mouth, the dead are called back to life. Jesus paved the way for the resurrection of our bodies by means of his own resurrection from the dead. Jesus really was and is a genuine human being, a real man, like us in every way, except without sin. His body really did suffer as he was flogged and beaten and pierced and crucified. He really did die. But that same body that died was brought back to life on the third day. That resurrection of the body shows the world that the burden of the world's sin was successfully removed as he bore in his own body. This is the demonstration of God to the world that all sin, every source of death, has been removed by the death of Jesus Christ, his Son. This body that rose is the body which he has for all eternity. It is the body which the disciples fingered and the women grabbed a hold of after he rose. Jesus said, A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Luke 24. In this body, Jesus ate with the disciples. He breathed upon them and gave many convincing proofs of his resurrection from the dead. He showed the nail marks to prove it was the same body that had been crucified. Now, how does one get to be, quote, considered worthy to attain that age and to the resurrection from the dead? As Jesus mentions here in verse 35. To be counted worthy is not by works which we do, but by the work of God in us. Before the bodily res resurrection, God produces in us by his powerful word a spiritual resurrection. Paul says in Ephesians 2, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. In holy baptism, the word made visible. God spoke and we came to life. The words that Jesus speaks are spirit and they are life. John 6. And that's why we in this world where death surrounds us need to keep on hearing the life-giving word of Jesus. Those who have been raised in this first resurrection will also be raised in the second resurrection. Philippians 3, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. We confess the resurrection of the body to comfort one another when we face death in all its forms. Who would want to live forever in this body as it now is? Our bodies are subject to death. And that does not just mean that someday this heart is going to stop beating. It means that already now our bodies experience weakness, deterioration, sickness. What we commonly call the effects of age is nothing else 
and little samples of death in our mortal bodies. But consider well this word of fact from the lips of Jesus. They cannot die anymore. Now, some have expressed disappointment at this statement of Jesus that in eternal life we will neither marry nor be given into marriage. Consider the Lord's word through the apostle that the marriage relationship on earth is a picture of that amazing, mysterious union between Christ and his church. The Lord would have our focus for eternal life to be on him. It's similar to another of the radical statements of the Lord that if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14. When we think of the world to come, he wants us to think of him who has washed us, his church, by the washing of water with the word to present us to himself as a radiant bride without any spot or wrinkle or blemish. Ephesians 5. In our union with the great bridegroom of the church, we can be certain that all our needs and desires will be met for all eternity. God created people for community. The human family is his creation. In the perfect world to come, the new creation, the Lord will certainly place us in perfect fellowship with others. If God were to describe it to us in full detail now, it would probably blow our minds. If there's no marriage in heaven, we can only assume that God has something better in store for us. Psalm 16 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore, the presence of God our Savior, that's all we need to know. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and in him we also will rise. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of Luke. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We also have a Bible study on the book of Genesis Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. at St. John's in the Fellowship Hall. You're welcome to join us. Thanks to our sponsors today and to our faithful partners at V1047. They are the best. And thank you for listening.